I started programming uh, 15 years ago, uh, there was this thing that would sometimes happen where something would go wrong in my program, um, and then it would sort of belch forth this impenetrable wall of text, and that was my sign that I was going to need to spend some time sort of groveling through my code trying to make sense of what had gone wrong. Um, but since then, uh, tool support has gotten a lot better. I, a lot of things are more sort of clearly presented. Um, so now when one of my programs fails, uh, it points out this really useful map <laughs> of um, exactly like what broke where and where I can go to start fixing it. Um, but sometimes I pair with kind of less experienced folks um, and I, I'll get an error. And for some reason, it looks like they're just still seeing that impenetrable wall of text like I used to get. <laughs> Um, so that makes me feel like I may have learned something about what I see in a stack trace when I'm reading it. Um, and so I thought it might be a good idea to try to step back and make sense of what it actually is that I've learned about that um, and try to present it as clearly as possible. Um, so. Um, this presentation is going to be a little bit dry, and I didn't get like a lot of fancy, fun pictures in it or, or anything. Um, and, and so, this is Desdemona. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's all. Uh, so first off, why practice reading stack traces? It, it's sort of like on the one hand, you can understand how it works, and then you kind of know how it works. Um, and it's a very like fiddly little particular skill. Uh, but on the other hand, like if you're programming, you're going to be seeing a lot of these. Um, and usually at times when like digging around through them, trying to make sense of them is not what you most want to be doing. Um, so on that front, like there are a bunch of little cycles in programming that get faster the more quickly you can sort of look at a stack trace and see what's important in it. Um, and I feel like that makes them kind of worth taking some sort of focused, focused attention for a little while. It's also, a, a stack trace will very often be kind of your first, your first glimpse into a project. Um, if you're new to a team or new to a project, you'll often start by sort of attacking a few bugs, attacking a few errors that somebody found in their logs and trying to uh, make sense of what, what went on with them. Um, it, a fairly common way to start contributing to an open source project is to be using it and have it break on you and then try to figure out what happened and make a patch for it. Um, so, so it's sort of often your first way into a project. And if you don't know your way around it, um, it will kind of slow you down and frustrate you a little bit. Uh, where if you do know your way around it, it starts being a way that you can have kind of a more fluent conversation with your code, where it, you, you ask it what it's doing and it actually tells you. <laughs> um, so my basic plan for today uh, is I'm going to do a, a little bit of sort of very low level, just kind of basics of what even is stack trace. Um, and then a whole bunch of uh, examples. <laughs> Uh, that I've tried to keep relatively short. Uh, basically, I, if any of you were at the uh, pairing workshop, uh, we did a uh, Roman numeral translating exercise. And uh, for the past week or two, I've been uh, writing really, really terrible implementations of that that break all the time and collecting when they break. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we're going to look at a bunch of those uh, breakages. Um, and then, um, at the end, there will be a little bit of kind of strategy for, all right, once you've read this, um, what do you do from there? Um, so most of the talk is going to be looking at these examples. They're pretty dense. I've cleaned them up for like legibility, um, but there's a lot of code in there. Don't worry about like understanding every detail of what's going on. The, like, I think one of the main things I hope you can get here is it, just sort of an intuitive feel for what looks important um, in a stack trace. Um, so just sort of pay attention to the examples, look at the shape of them, maybe murmur to yourself a guess at kind of what the interesting bits are in them. Um, and I'll move through them at a fairly solid pace, but don't worry if you're missing stuff. Um, 
So how do you read a stack trace? <laughs> uh, is it, well, so first off, uh, what's a stack? Um, so uh, when you uh, want your computer to do something, um, for example, uh, to uh, feed your cat, which uh, Desdemona wants my computer to do, but without much luck so far. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so you call a function that's going to do something, and then it maybe calls another function on the way there. So if you're going to feed a cat, one of the steps in the, on the way there is you have to prepare some food. One of the steps toward preparing the food is that you need to open the can. One of the steps of opening the can is you need to turn the can opener. This is the like nice, really exciting wet food that makes you demand everything. Um, um, and so. At any given time, a program like you uh, is in the middle of doing a lot of sort of progressively bigger and bigger things. So there, there's the sort of outside of the call stack where sort of requests come in. And then there's the very inside, which is kind of the most, most detailed thing that the computer's working on right now. Um, and I'm sort of pointedly using these words outside for kind of closest to the user and inside for closest to the computer. Because I'm used to saying top and bottom, but for reasons that will become clear in a few minutes, that's really unhelpful if you're giving examples in a few different languages. <laughs> um, so suppose something goes wrong in a like step fairly low down in what your program is doing. Your computer deals with it by telling you most of the things you need to know. Um, so it tells you what actually went wrong. Um, so it gives you what exception it threw, what, what message was associated with it. Um, for each step that it was on in the process, it gives you kind of what function it was inside. So um, here in this Roman numeral converter, we're um, sort of inside <laughs> module there means that I'm just running a script, but it called out to a function called main, and that called out to a function called translate input, um, and that's where it blew up. Um, it also tells you what file it was in for each of those frames of the stack um, and what line of the fi uh, file it was on when it failed. Um, and if your language is especially helpful, um, it will even tell you like what line, of co what line of code it was running, like what the line of code actually was. Uh, Python does that. I don't know if there are others that do that. Um, but I only really noticed it while I was preparing for this talk, and it's great. <laughs> um, so that's uh, how you read a stack trace. Um, <laughs> thank, you, thank you all for coming. Um, <laughs> but OK, say, say you're looking at this. Um, knowing the mechanics isn't necessarily super helpful. Um, so. The next, the next kind of big thing I want you to take away from this is that there are really like only usually say one to three lines of this that are actually interesting and then a whole bunch of noise. Um, and the key to making sense of stack traces quickly is basically learning to like teaching your brain to ignore all that noise as soon as possible. Um, and the first really interesting line um, the one that's kind of always interesting is where did it actually break? So that's the inside most uh, line of code that it was on. Um, so let's uh, look through some fairly straightforward examples of where something broke. Um, so here's more Python code. I think it's even the one we were looking at before. Um, all right, it broke right there. Um, it was, uh, it was trying to convert to an int, um, and I wrote in quit, and it had no idea what to do. Um, another Python example. Yep, still right at the end. Uh, so innermost frame of the stack, always at the bottom here in Python. Uh, this is a little different. This is a uh, Ruby example. Uh, this is one of the places where um, this sort of brings up one of the places where language really matters to how you're going to read one of these, because there are a few things to notice that are different about this. Um, one is that, uh, well, so you can see it's got a lot of the same basic stuff. You've got 
file it was in, the function it was running, the line that it failed on. Um, it's a little less helpful than Python in that it doesn't like actually spell out the line of code for you. You have to go to it or if you're lucky, like click on a link in your IDE. Um, I, it also does something that I, isn't necessarily obvious but is really important, which is um, it's inside out compared to the uh, Python one. So where Python starts from like the outermost layer of the program and goes down, this starts from the innermost layer of the program where it failed and goes out. Um, so in this case, where did it break? Oh, up here. Um, it was trying to convert nil to a Roman numeral and it didn't know how to do anything with nil uh, because using nil is horrible. <laughs> um, I have a Java example too. It's uh, sort of longer and wider in the Java tradition, but uh, <laughs> it still has the uh, same essentials, the method of an object in a package that it failed on, the file that it was in, the line that it was on, everything that happened. Uh, like Ruby, it's starting at the inside and working its way out rather than starting at the outside and working its way in. So, uh, Illegal argument exception. Another Ruby example. It's failing at the top there. Another Python example. Failing right there. Well, now that's not very helpful. I, lib Python pyfiglet init. Um, it was trying to do self.text equals list map or list text. I, I've never seen that code before in my life. Um, so, so this is one of the situations you'll hit is um, you're calling out to a library, in this case um, for making giant ASCII art letters out of your Roman numeral. <laughs> um, and something fails like inside the library. So it's useful to know the line that it actually failed on. Um, but that doesn't really have kind of context that's useful to you right away. So the next line that might be interesting is all right, where, where did you call it? Um, and for that, you basically want to um, start at the inside of the stack trace and work your way out until you hit code that's yours. Um, in these examples, code that's mine always has the word numerals in the name of the uh, project. Um, but yeah, so start at the inside, which here is the bottom and work your way up until you find, oh, it's that one. Um, so what I was trying to do was print a figlet of my translated input um, and I've got another null. I, if, if you want to get a lot of broken code examples um, really quickly, um, a helpful way to do that is to uh, use nulls liberally in your code. Um, a lot of people find that so helpful that they'll also do it in production code a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, here's a, another Python example. Again, start at the inside, work your way up, and there it is. Um, also an example of where seeing the line of code can sometimes give you a cue, a, a cue as to why you might not have found applications kdoin.config. Um, uh, Ruby example. Um, so again, starting on the inside, but the inside means up at the top here. Uh, we were failing inside a library called Necromancer, um, which is a uh, tool for converting different types of objects to each other, in this case a string to an int, uh, which is called Necromancer because that's how Ruby library naming works. Um, <laughs> I, so start at the inside, move out, oh, there it is. Uh, so here's a Java example, but being a Java example, this is kind of terrible and huge, and it has a lot of things that aren't very like pedagogically interesting. So I trimmed it down a bunch. Um, and this is really, like, this is still a Java stack trace. It's just a simpler Java stack trace. Um, so again, the um, top of the stack trace is the inside of the stack. Uh, you work your way down, and oh yeah, um, we were 
just trying to run the command line interface and it was trying to convert to something and it broke horribly. So, memo to self, do not uh, touch microphone. Um, <laughs> so that's a lot of time on kind of the inside layers of, of the stack trace. Um, there's also this kind of outside end of things, um, which is normally actually, the outside tends to be a little less interesting because it's sort of further away from what failed, uh, but it can be helpful in a few cases. Basically, if, if you need to know how, how you got there. Um, so for example, I worked on an application uh, that had like Java servlets and various sort of automatic jobs that ran periodically that were all running inside the same container, all like writing things to the same log. So when I saw something fail, I didn't necessarily know, all right, was a user trying to do something here? Was the system just like running something it does every night or every five minutes? Um, so that's when you start looking sort of over toward the outside of things to know, all right, what actually kicked off this whole process? Um, sometimes the answer is really simple. Um, so here are some examples of, all right, um, starting from the outside going in, oh, hey, we were running a script. Here's a Ruby example starting from the outside going in, we were running a script again. Here's a Java example. Uh, we were running a script again, which in this case looks like calling a main function um, because principles. Um, and then there's sort of framework land where things start getting more complicated. <laughs> um, so So to figure out what was happening, you kind of want to start from the outside, but there's also kind of a lot of noise in here. Uh, and one thing you want to learn to do is kind of collapse a lot of the noise. One kind of noise is, it, it, frameworks are especially prone to this because you've got sort of a setup where there's this big kind of superstructure of code that's running and making all kind of de kinds of decisions about when to call your code. Um, so there will be a big stack of stuff that has nothing to do with you before, before it gets into the bits you're actually interested in. Um, in this case, um, for example, there, there's like a whole bunch of layers of um, code running through this library called Flask, which is a, a kind of lightweight um, web app framework for, for Python. Um, I, usually if you see a stack of stuff that's all inside the same library, you can just sort of ignore most of it. Look at the ends of it and like if you really want to understand what's going on inside it, then maybe dig into it. But at a first pass, just pretend that like that whole middle section of a bunch more calls to Flask are not there. Um, but fundamentally, the, that big Flask section also tells you the, basis of, the basics of what's going on here. All right, we were... Um, serving this web application and it called out to one of my controller methods and that's what broke. A uh, similar situation in Ruby. Um, the, this is the massive section of Sinatra which is a lightweight web application framework for Ruby. Um, you can just pretend that most of those don't exist. Um, So, so as I think I hinted earlier, a lot of learning to read stack traces quickly is uh, learning what to ignore. Lots of lines in the same code that isn't yours, usually not something you need to pay a lot of attention to. Uh, code that's above the code you need, that's sort of further out than the code you need to answer your own questions. Um, usually not something you want to pay a lot of attention to unless you're trying to actually get this kind of context information. Um, 
there's a bunch to ignore in this particular Ruby example. There's also like, there's three lines of WebRick stuff that's, oh, that's kind of uninteresting. There's a whole bunch of rack, which is not super interesting. But, but again, you can sort of see the basics. All right, it was running a web server. It was going through this framework. It called out to this bit of my code. Um, that Ruby example had a lot to ignore. Um, in this Java example, I, I've also, uh, it, it, so you will never actually see code produce exactly this stack trace. I have shortened all of the names of these things to fit on the slide, just. Um, but here's a big section of spring code. All right, take out all but the middle of that. Um, here's some stuff running inside my servlet container. Uh, it's not very interesting. Here's some reflection stuff. All right, so, so what in the other languages was just like a method call um, in Java is like go through reflection and a few steps of it to figure out how to call a method. But it's not actually very interesting. Like all that reflect stuff you can ignore until you need it. <laughs> um, and, and you're left with sort of the basics of, all right, it was running in a servlet container. It was handling a git request. Um, and the handler passed it off to my git roman numeral uh, controller method. Brief pause. Are there any uh, questions that people have developed so far? Yes. That's a really good question. Um, at a quick glance, I didn't see a whole lot um, apart from um, IDEs. So, so like Eclipse and IntelliJ um, will both do some stuff for I should say like IntelliJ or PyCharm or RubyMine or that whole kind of family. Uh, will do some useful formatting in that they'll kind of find, they'll find all the lines of code for you and often let you just sort of click directly into any line of code from the uh, stack trace. But try, but I haven't seen anything um, that actually tries to identify what's important and tries to sort of digest it for you. Um, if anybody knows of something like that, I'd love to hear about it. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, so, so the question is, it's, it's nice to be able to see where it failed, but that often doesn't tell you right away kind of what actually failed. It, it doesn't necessarily show me what the problem was in my code that made it break that way. Um, stay tuned, I'm going to be coming around to that in just a minute. <laughs> um, after a brief digression through a couple of kind of Little interesting subgroups of stack traces. Uh, one is um, kind of nested errors. So, so sometimes you'll have one error that bubbles up and then something else catches it and uh, throws a new error. Um, and unless you're prepared for it, it makes things a little harder to read. Uh, so, so you've sort of got one error that was thrown from the sort of very insides of the code and then it was caught somewhere else and a new error based on it was, was thrown out from there. In Python, that ends up looking like this. So in, in, in Python, the, it shows the innermost error first, which is interesting because it shows the outermost stack frame first. <laughs> and then it shows you the error that caused it. Um, so if you're looking for kind of the root cause there, it's up here at the innermost layer of the topmost section. Um, but then if you want to see kind of what through the next error in the uh, sequence. That's at the innermost layer of the next section out. Um, and the kind of original thing that kicked this all off is 
floating off here in the in the middle, sort of at the top of the bottommost section. Um, in Java, it does it slightly differently. The it, it shows you the kind of last thing that failed first. Um, so the ultimate root cause here is. this one. So th this is kind of the first exception that happened. And that bubbled up to here, uh, which had ultimately been called by this. So the sort of call stack went da 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 da. Um, and it leaves you with this sort of obscure dot 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 nine more <laughs> node at the end. Wh what it means by that is these also nine, th these nine lines were also part of the stack in this one. <laughs> Um, and I wanted to get a Ruby example of this too. Um, it turns out I can't do that because as, uh, um, apparently Ruby doesn't actually show you sort of full traces for nested exceptions. Although I'm about 12 to 18 months out of date on Ruby and they were making useful priority. You can at least attach a cause to an exception last I heard. So it may be that things are getting better on that front. Um, and then another kind of interesting case of exceptions uh, is if you're running tests, um, you'll get most of the testing frameworks out there will sort of treat, uh, treat assertion failures as exceptions. Um, but there it's, it's particularly important to remember that the line that failed is not really the line that's interesting. It's <laughs> sort of, especially in the case of assertion failures, um, the problem isn't at the line that failed. The problem, the, the line that failed is just the line where you were checking whether there was a problem. So that's, so that's your cue to like go back and say, all right, well, it gave me a Roman numeral back and it didn't throw any errors at all. Um, it just gave me five instead of six. Um, same situation in RSpec and Ruby. Um, same situation in JUnit and Java. Again, you've got the failure at the top and a bunch of stack that doesn't really tell you where to look in your program. It just tells you where to look in your test. Um, although, bear in mind, where to look in your test can be really important information. Uh, in one of my terrible implementations of a Roman numeral translator, uh, I got this error um, just after I thought I had done some code that should successfully uh, translate six to VI. And then this failed, so I was like, oh, I must have gotten that wrong. But then I actually, you know, read it, and it told me, oh, no, you, you, you didn't fail to, you, you didn't fail to write the next feature, you actually broke the last feature you wrote. Um, it's now translating five to VI. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that's again like something to be aware of is, all right, what, <laughs> where did it actually fail? Be sure, be sure to read the failure that's in front of you, not the failure that's, that your mind has been preparing <laughs> and anticipating for the last few minutes. <laughs> um, and also remember that, you know, a test can catch a straight up failure. Um, a lot of earlier test frameworks would even make this sort of distinction between failures and errors, where a failure is I asserted something that wasn't true, and an error is I was just calling something in this code and it blew up. Um, that distinction is less honored at the framework level these days because it isn't actually that useful, um, but it's very useful to have in your mind when you're looking at something. Like, this tells me, all right, there actually is something going wrong at encoder line three or something leading into it. Um, which brings, brings us back around to uh, the question that uh, you were asking. What did go wrong? So I don't have as many, there aren't really good instant answers uh, for this. Um, the main thing you want to do is start 
looking at the code and looking at what failed in the code and thinking about where that could have come from. So, um, yeah, I'll actually go back and grab one of these. So here, here's an example. Here is, well, what it, what it tells me is value error, invalid literal for int with base 10, um, 3D. Well, on some level, what went wrong is the user typed in the number they wanted to translate to a Roman numeral, and what they typed was 3D, and that's not a number. So how am I supposed to do anything with it? <laughs> um, So that's, uh, it's useful to know where that value came from. It's useful to be able to, you'll then, like, to, f to figure that out, you'll kind of want to look back to the code, follow your way up to the stack. Conveniently, I picked a Python example so I can look at some of this code. Um, so it said return int of string. Well, yes, that blew up when I gave it a string that wasn't of an int. Um, it had tried to parse an int from, uh, the input string, that suggests that I'd read a string in from the user and was then trying to parse it. So um, at that point it starts to feel like, all right, maybe something was wrong with my validation code, maybe I didn't have any validation code, so I should have done some sort of control on what kind of inputs were allowed. Um, maybe this looks like something I would want to this looks like a bad situation I would expect to happen sometimes and want to deal with more cleanly. Um, so, so the basic advice um, is look at what failed and think about what could have happened to make it fail. Um, often there will be a particular value, like a parameter that was passed into your function, a field on an object, that was associated with the failure. Um, think about how it could have gotten that way. If, if it's a field, look for other code that could have touched that field not long before and put, the, put a bad value into it. Um, often it will also be about some sort of kind of outside condition beyond your code. Um, example of that too. <laughs> so here I'm getting a file not found. A file was missing somewhere on the file system. The, so again, st look at the code, look at what went wrong, start making theories. Um, maybe the file got deleted. Maybe I'm sort of developing, developing this incrementally and I haven't written it yet. I probably know if that's the case. Um, maybe I forgot to mount a shared directory on NFS where all the files I need live. Surely nobody would depend on that for running their code. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, maybe I have a really obvious typo on line six of webapp.py, for example. Um, so, so start just trying to come up with theories for what could have gone wrong. If you got a null pointer exception, um, or equivalent error in your language of choice. All right, what, what values are you using that could have been null? Where did those values come from? Is there, if there's only one thing you're calling a method on in that line, it's probably that. Why would that be null? If there are a few things, start thinking about which one it could be and trying to think through um, How to uh, <laughs> how to test your theory? Uh, and so basically, do some science. Um, once you've got some ideas for what could have broken, um, try to think about how you could make it break locally. If it's something that you feel like you can look at your code and pretty well understand how it would have gotten into that situation at a low level, you can probably write a unit test of it. Um, if it's something where you don't quite see how the code fits together, but once you sort of looked out to outer layers of things, you could see what a user was doing, 
maybe you can boot up your app, not in production, um, and click around and make it break the same way. Um, it, sometimes you can't, you don't end up finding a way to do either of those. Often, if you've got one of these situations where there's like a bunch of stuff that could have been, could have gone wrong. Um, at the very least, if you're in that situation, one thing to do is try to make it so that the failure is more helpful to you next time it happens. Uh, so good things to do with that are add some logging. If, if you threw the exception that, that you're seeing, um, make sure that you're reporting on any values that you're complaining about in there. If you, if you said, you know, not a number, well, what wasn't a number? <laughs> um, if, if you got a null pointer exception um, and there were a few different places it could have been, maybe split up the line of code that had it so that if you throw another null pointer exception in the same situation, just knowing the line of code will point you immediately to the, th the thing that was null. Um, so it, that's actually, there's kind of a general pattern there. The less you're doing on any one line of code, the more a stack trace will tell you because the line of code is all you're going to get from it. Um, so yeah, it, if you hit a stack trace that really isn't telling you anything, getting more information to it through logging, through better exception messages, through cleaner, simpler code um, will sort of help help make your job easier when this happens again. So just to kind of go over the basic idea here, um, something breaks in your code, you get this enormous stack trace. Um, first thing it will tell you is where it broke um, by basically looking at the very inside of the stack trace. Uh, if that doesn't tell you enough, you might need to go outside a little bit from there to see where you called it, to see what you were trying to do. Um, and if you don't really know what context it was running in, you might need to attack it from the outside as well and see how, how you got there, um, which will often mean uh, sort of blurring your eyes and ignoring a lot of noise. Once you've seen what broke and where, think about why it happened and then once you know why it happened, think of three other reasons that it might have happened so that uh, you're not bound to uh, <laughs> one theory. Uh, and then try to prove or disprove all of them. <laughs> See what you can learn. Um, and if you can't learn enough, uh, make it so that your future self can learn more. Sounds like it's over. Thank you. Thank you.